Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FM. I'm Kathy Holmes, and in the Zoom booth with me today is arguably one of my favorite people on the planet. Daniel Elliott is an incredible artist, and now he's a writer. We've got tons to unpack. Welcome to the program, Dan. How are you, my friend? Hey, I am so awesome. Thanks for having me, Kathy. It's great to be here, and I and I appreciate you bringing me on board. Well, I love when you're coming on because, and our audience does too, you have become very well known as an artist uh, on Vancouver Island specifically, but I know much, you know, your range is much broader, um, but in specific regarding the winds of change and the beautiful, beautiful, gigantic installations. You know, many people have watched us on sh the show on Shaw and Act 3 on Shaw, uh, sort of talking about some of your art pieces. But, you know, we haven't really had a lot of time usually when we do those interviews. So this way we get to unpack everything. And I'm just so excited. <laughs> so why don't you give everybody a little bit of a rundown about who you are, winds of change and all that groovy stuff. Well, yeah, you know, I, I I was a commercial fisher for a good part of my life, um, and and as a youngster, I mean, we we did some shell fishing um, commercially, and yeah. I remember some tides we'd be uh, I'd be packing and hauling uh, up to forty nine sacks of steamers and little necks in in, in a day. Yeah, uh, that yeah. would be the digging for the day. And this was done um, on the northern part of Cortez Island called Von Donup Inlet. And, and you know, as a 13-year-old doing this, this was really difficult child labor. It no was, kidding, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're always praying for the tide to come in because that means, you know, work stopped and we could play. And, yeah. and uh, but every time the, the tide would turn, and there are big tides in, in June and July, so the, I'd be like, oh, my God, you know, it's going to be terrible, like working in the sun all day. It's a, the inlet is trapped with the heat. And so you, it's hot and you're digging clams. And it was it was beautiful and it was difficult at the same time. And I remember uh, kind of secretly praying for the breeze to come. Totally, and, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, and it was also, it felt good, but it yeah. signaled uh, the tide turn to flood which covered up the beach and we were happy as clams <laughs> <laughs> well there you go there you but, go but you know um so so i i carried that thought with me and and i and i always kind of thought that i wanted uh something different in my life and so when i left the commercial industry in 1998 i i worked in the school system and I also worked in the prison. And sometimes, um, Kathy, it was so frustrating to try and explain, continually explain myself with my uh, cultural roots. Yes. And, and I should have done that in the beginning here, but um, that I'm uh, both Scottish and Coast Salish, and I'm yeah. I'm from the Staminas territory and nation. And uh, anyway, we're doing that now, and that's okay. No, <laughs> but it, you know, it happens I, that way. Exactly. That's often how it happens. Yeah. And and so I, I anyway, in this frustration, I, I felt muted in a sense where I couldn't articulate, I couldn't explain. And, um, and throughout my whole life, and even when the winds of change uh, happened as a clam digger, I began um, a really uh, important art direction and and uh, so in 1974, I took uh, private lessons from a fellow named Michael B. Gerge, who was this European watercolor professor that happened to retire in Nanaimo. And I was just oh, and, lucky you. I know, I know, it was just amazing. So here I am, uh, knowing and you know, and I have been an artist in painting since I was a kid, but this was real direction for me. And what ended up happening was. I began to learn a very uh, disciplined European fine arts uh, program with him. I did it for five years till I was 20 years old. And uh, so I, I was challenged with mixing my native heritage and this fine arts stuff. And, and it never really 
took hold for a long time. So backing up a bit. So when, when after all this frustration time with corrections and with the school system and, and now we're, we're pe Canadians are understanding truth and reconciliation piece. Yes. Yes. I thought, I thought, you know, this frustration, I was like, Hey, wait a minute. I can paint. I'm an artist. I can say it with a really loud voice. Yes. I can, I can say it through art that really hasn't been done. And so I painted what was um, beautiful about our culture. And, and that was easy. And, you know, and I have part of a scene, you can see some canoes in the background, but it's, mm -hmm. and then I painted what was the interruption. And my gosh, we've been hit hard in Canada with uh, what happened, uh, you know, yeah. with residential school and kids that are still being found um, in, in unmarked graves and, and so there's a lot of pain around that piece. So in order for me to 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 paint that, I I was able to uh, go into some very very deep uh, pieces. And then I uh, and out of that I also painted what was beautiful and wonderful about what is going to happen. That's the way I see it in our yeah, Canadian yeah, history. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're so right, Dan. I mean, we certainly are changing, but while we might be changing, we've got a long way to go. Um, UNDRIP and the, um, the, the premise behind Canadians really taking an honest look at what happened and owning what we did, uh, I think is just so very valuable. But your paintings don't, don't represent that dismal piece. Rather, the lifting, uh, the lifting up of the heritage throughout the strife, right? Yeah, yeah, and that was, you know, that's always been my end goal as a counselor. I want to figure out what's working, what's right with the situation. Absolutely. But I did go into, um, like, I could paint some pretty horrific stuff because we know some of the scenes are um, without a doubt horrific. And I thought, okay, yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah, not really my way, but I thought, okay, how, where do I want to go with this? But uh, I painted um, a scene called Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, Ground Zero. Where did this all start? So yes. I painted, and it was, um, I only could do a study. I couldn't do a, a big a piece. And all of these bodies of work of 14 are all done in watercolors, which yeah. is my forte. And one of the most challenging mediums. However, it's it's what I love and it's my my deepest expression, I think, medium. Yeah. But I, I remember um for the first time in my artistic life, because I've been painting uh since since the early 70s, uh it was the first time in my life I was putting a sound or I was saying something. And it was some of my training around um uh, counseling and that we took these uh, playbacks theater and that so I was able to verbalize while I'm painting which I've never did before and I'm like I'm swearing and I'm just like mad and I'm allowing yes. that to kind of enter the painting because of yes so because you know I think that people don't understand as it from a painter's perspective that while you're bringing this art out you're actually processing and so, and and I've never asked you this question, Dan, and so forgive me if I'm stepping into your personal life in this way, but were you a victim ever of the, um, of the residential school system or? No, I, I wasn't. And that's what's uh, interesting. You know, people think, okay, the residential school system ended in 1996. Yes, and, yes. And that was, um, I thought, okay, well, that was a, a little surprisingly not that long ago. But... No, not at all. But what happened for some of us, uh, intergenerational, we've affect, we've been affected by that. But I also, um, even though residential schools ended, I suffered some sexual abuse in a private Christian school. And it was some of my um, siblings or cousins, and, and it was very specifically uh, First Nation students in that school. And so some of the work was my own journey around that healing piece I needed to do. And I think, not I think, I know that's part of the reason why I got into the helping field after a fisherman yeah, yeah. was my own understanding, but also my healing and then how can I 
um, you know, support kids that have been through some some trauma and addictions and, and they're hurting too. And so I have this kind of, so for me, that was art. Um, art became a vehicle of change for me. And, and I say that with, um, it allowed me to create altered states of consciousness. It was a way for me to escape some of the abuses around alcohol and and uh, addictions my father was suffering in our home. And I was a victim of violence and family violence in our home. So it would have been so easy to just continue with that cycle of drinking drugs, trying to disassociate from that. But the artwork for me uh, changed um, how I could see that. And to be clear, Dan, we know that not every First Nations person uh, has gone through alcohol and addictions struggles. There are some, just like in every other culture, but there's more of a, the dominant factor, I think, for the repression of being able to speak to community, to be able to be heard, um, you know, being placed, uh, you know, on reserve and not having the same rights as other Canadians have had for so many years. You know, there's been, th th it's more than that, that piece, it, there's that trauma that is affected by it. Yeah, and then that's some of the effects of colonization. But you know exactly. what I what I do see, um, Kathy, is that I see um, a lot of uh, our elders and a lot of people here are completely alcohol and drug free. But yes. the ones that are drinking and still haven't done the work and the healing they needed to, uh, and society sees them as very um oh yeah those uh, you know there are all these problems with these guys drinking and and so on but i see so many people that aren't and so many successful uh like i was at a workshop in vancouver last week uh for with first nation health authority there was like i close to 400 people there yeah and and they're all healers and helpers and counselors and 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 just this whole movement of, of, you know, coming from the province to coming together. And it just felt to be amazing to be a part of that whole, whole uh, picture. Well, and there's something to be said for, um, to be a counselor and having experienced the situation yourself so that, you know, you're coming to it really from a place of knowledge and understanding when you're working with someone who is in the middle of trying to break free from whatever those uh, those constraints are for their living their very best life. I, I'm reminded of one of the paintings, actually, that you did in the installation that you created that was up at VIU. Uh, you had a beautiful group of people there for the winds of change and as you you know showcase some of your pieces um, but the one that sticks out for me in this dialogue is the one where you uh, where one of your um one of your mentors one of your friends uh was laying down on the street after going through the addictions and you know a, a, but yet there was still even in the the despair of seeing that there was also this great light of hope that came out of it as well. Would you mind talking a little bit about that particular piece? Yeah, that that piece. Uh, this this fellow was an elder of mine, uh, and I was at a workshop in in two thousand and five in Lake Cowichan, and this guy told his story of of uh, being from residential school and then trying to go through the army and then drinking and then he ended up on the streets and he said he went from victoria to seattle to vancouver and he did this triangle for mm -hmm. for years and uh his grandfather came in a vision and and told him that if you are under this bench he said your spirit and you are going to die tomorrow no more wow. Quit drinking so so he in that state, he, you know, he kicks over this bottle of, of wine and 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 then hasn't tested a drop. And that was May 1980. Wow. So, you know, so this is over 40 years ago. And he's still um the most amazing elder. He he's um a very spiritual and all he does is healing work. And from that moment, he went to treatment and 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 never has had a drink, but he also uh, did a vision quest with a uh, for for six years to become a spiritual uh, leader. 
So, so there's a lot of hope I have. And so when I finally decided to paint this one, and you've probably seen the full size of it. It's like I have four, indeed. I've been very blessed. <laughs> yeah. It's like four by six foot watercolor, which is like yeah, it's huge. It's Mount huge. Everest for anybody yeah. that knows watercolors. Yeah. And you know, and, and when I painted that was July, 2019. And, and I took my family up to Quadra Island for camping because we camp there every and I dropped them off, set everything up. And I drove home and I stayed home and set up camping with my family. I painted that painting. I wow. needed that quiet place just to focus on, on that piece. And it's called the Transformation Song. So his grandfather sang that song and, and, and drummed them off the streets. And there's like these spiritual ghosted ancestors uh, welcoming his transformation. And there's another fellow that is in addictions. So it's like hope and trauma and all these things kind of in this big painting, but you feel the transformation in this piece. Yeah, you absolutely do. There's no question you feel it. Actually, I could say that for all of your paintings. I'm curious though, with the, the, the particular painting that we've been speaking of, Transformational Song, uh, I'm curious, have you, you've obviously shown the elder, what was the elder's response to you uh, choosing him for such an amazing piece? Well, that was a good good point because I did have him come in for the sketch, for the for the study, for the outline, because I really wanted it to be very correct for him. Because I said if it wasn't, um, you know, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to show it. But um, so at first he's he's reluctant because he doesn't like um, to be you know lifted up in that way. He doesn't yes, like. Yes, I understand. A very uh, humble person. Very very humble, and you'd miss him. Um, in a lineup if he didn't know who he was you know but yeah, uh yeah. i always he, value uh, people uh, like that i really yeah, do they do such amazing things and yet are unsung heroes yeah they are so so yeah. when he um when he's seen the fine the, the the finished piece yeah i called him in to make sure that it was going to be correct and really he didn't he couldn't he couldn't speak because it was at the core of his transformation wow and he he just was like that's it so uh last uh fall um when the salmon were running um i was at the tail end of making this documentary that you mentioned earlier yes exactly um, and it's by the same title so the uh, it's uh truth art and reconciliation and that's the name of that was a transformation from winds of change so the art show was Winds of Change, and then out of that became um, a documentary. And then so when we were filming him by the river, and we had this beautiful uh, big bundle of smudge, and and um, mm. and we asked, you know, we were talking about the painting, and and uh, we weren't sure if we were going to actually show it on the video because it's very very powerful. Yes, because he. He spoke to the painting and he just, uh, and he, he didn't speak actually for like 15 seconds because he's, he's going to cry. Like he's, he's yeah, very, very totally emotional. choked up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he just said, you nailed it. You nailed that transformation moment. And he said, I just can't believe that when I seen it, he said, I just can't believe you nailed that moment for me. And so he was feeling those feelings and then, so it was a, a, an amazing um, affirmation for me, for him to 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 have that, to say, yes, that's it. And you you got that piece. And, and so those that's like a pivotal piece in the art show um, transformation song. Now I had a woman from, uh, that came up with her friend and I, what a, we have a mutual friend that they came up and seen the show. I wasn't there, I think I was, that was off that day, but they came to the show and she is a writer from Salt Spring. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got a call uh, a while later and they said, um, Kath and Jesse, this writer from Salt Spring wants to meet you. And uh, so I went down to Duncan to my friend's house and, uh, and she was an amazing spiritual woman. I just connected with her instantly. And she's and I read some of her some of her writing is absolutely unbelievably 
uh, brilliant and rich, and I'll just sick and home, Mary. But she said, um, I, I need to know more about these paintings. They are speaking to me. This needs to be in a book. This needs to yeah. be in a book, book, book. And wow. I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm an artist. I'm not a writer, am I? But uh, out of that, um, uh -huh. I spent um, a few sessions. Uh, went, I went down for a week to Salt Spring mm -hmm. to her place and and she's brilliant. She had all these uh, recording devices and I just told my stories of each painting and what else was going on. And she said, I'm just going to massage them. And, and it's your book. But so, so we have a book, it's completed. It's not, we're waiting for a publisher because there's, there's color separation. It, it makes it very expensive for publishers. Of course. Yeah. It's very expensive. So, but it, it so, does, uh, but I've, I've had, had the privilege. Sorry, hon. I've had the privilege of looking through it and reading segments and pieces of it. And oh my gosh, I can't wait till it's bound and ready for people to see. But you're right, it's very rich in color. Uh, many of your early paintings are in the book as well. Uh, and so that must have been, with all due respect, very transformational for you. So, oh, you know, yeah. what was, what did this all, you know, how, how did this all come about from once, once you started reading your own life in the pages? Well, it was it was amazing because it was like, you know, I and I just I told my uh, story of all the parts and pieces that happened to me, because I think it's it's important. You know, there's things that I would like to hide. And 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 in, in the documentary, I said, you know, I said, I'd rather have not done this in a sense, because I'd rather live my life and just do my thing and not worry about that. But I said, there's some teachings, there's some lessons that. I feel uh, that I have to share. I need to be sharing it. So I, I I went for it, and you know, it's a legacy. It's a story uh, that my children and my grandchildren will have a sense of um, our history. And and I painted all of these paintings, Kathy, while working full time as a drug and alcohol counselor in our community. So some yeah. some nights. <laughs> I'm yeah. like painting till two or three in the morning going, oh, yeah. gosh, I got to get up in three hours. <laughs> I know what you mean. I, there's, there's something about the passion that comes yeah. to it. And when you're lost and absorbed in the work itself and the messages that come out of it, it, it you're in the flow. It's very hard to stop when you're in the flow. Um, you know, if you, I'm just going to take a moment here for a second for people who've just tuned in. If you've just tuned in, you are listening to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FM. I'm Kathy Holmes. I am beyond delighted to be your host today, especially because my guest is, you know, so, so inspirational in my in my life and in many of the lives uh, of our community. And so I, I'm, I'm always delighted. I've worked with Dan. I've spent many years. He was on our television show, Act 3, uh, that you can watch on Shaw Spotlight. Uh, he has his own little section of it called Raven Tales, which is way too much fun. Um, but, you know, I, I think the reason why I wanted you to come to the show today specifically was because not only is it inspirational for uh, you know for you and for me and for anyone who sees this again it's that transformational piece that is happening within our community as a direct result of the gift that you bring and so while spirit has spoken to you spirit is speaking to the rest of us as well mm -hmm. and it's a brilliant brilliant thing so, so Dan, you know, there's a, a few other pieces. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, if you're hearing a train in the background, my apologies. This is a Zoom call uh, that we are recording on CHLY. My apologies if there's some background noise. Sometimes that happens in the day. Um, so, Dan, you know, some of the pieces have been very exciting for me to witness that you do. And I know that they're part of the documentary and I know that they'll be part of the book. But one of the other pieces that I loved so much was when you were, when the, the lifting of the roof, right. Uh, off mm -hmm. the residential school and of the, the parts where, where spirit, the negative side of things was coming out. And yet you're surrounded you the way you've painted it. Some of your other inspirational elders were standing right there. Can we talk about some of those people in that painting also? 
Yeah, there's um, that that one that you're speaking of is called the um, smoke of torment. That's correct. And, yes. And and um, that was the Cooper Island Residential School, which is now uh, the former site is now on Penelicut Island, which is south of uh, Thetis Island on, in the Gulf Islands. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother went to that school as well as. I, I found out last year uh, there was like 60 of my relatives, her side of the family, all went to that school. Yeah. And they called it Little Alcatraz. Wow. So it was like this horrible prison. And she did escape. And I thought she escaped from there uh, and, and was hidden. But there was uh, another story that I heard from my auntie that was quite uh, alarming. But... That was really the first painting I did uh, to honor and acknowledge uh, the my grandmother and how she survived all of that and to raise a family. But the smoke of torment is is the it's all the uh, policies and laws and all the things uh, that were incorrectly uh, put upon Indigenous people in these schools. Yeah, and, yeah. and 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 the smoke of torment is I based it loosely because I used to you know study theology in the Bible growing up and going to Christian school. So I have and it's actually really helped me with some of those paintings so as I have a a, a really different perspective on how I Absolutely. see it. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's like sure. yeah, so it's um it's a part of like a, a verse in Revelation about the smoke of their torment will send it forever, meaning the destruction of the evil or not good or the things that were so destructive uh, yeah. have no place on this earth and no place of yeah. part of humanity. So, uh, so the eagle is um, kind of almost like lava colors. Mm -hmm. I did it like these golds and reds and yellows and almost like a firebird, I guess. But um, and lifting off the uh, the roof lets out the the torment. And it was, uh, and I remember crying and shaking when I finished that piece because uh, it's a part of my history. It's part of my family. And for my grandmother to kind of box that away because she had no no counselors for her. There was no help. There was just, they just found a way to compartmentalize and carry on. And she lived till she was 99 and six months. Wow. Almost just a four months short of 100. Wow. Incredible. So I, I seen her at Kiwanis, which, you, you know, you know where that is. She, yes, she, was I in, do. she was in that home there. And I mm -hmm. remember um, she was losing her English and beginning to speak Hulkamedum, which is our Coast Salish language here. And but but she was whispering to me and she was like, don't say anything. But uh, she, she she envisioned herself back in residential school. But she said they're the food is good and they're treating me so nice and they're wow so she had a reframe and i was like i, I can't say anything uh, and it was it was such a lovely amazing uh way for i think for her to you know finish out her, her last bit of her life to do a reframe to be treated well do you think that your grandmother and again i apologize if i'm being voyeuristic and i i'm really not meaning to Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's helpful when when we, you know, when we because people are very judgmental, I think, of First Nations people still it's better than it's been for sure. But there, you know, there was a time I remember when, you know, people were very, very unkind. Um, and I like to say that that's changing in a, in a good way, um, but but not as quickly as I'd like to see it change as well. But do you think that your grandmother ever actually forgave the situation through her reframing it? Um, yeah, you know, I'm not sure about about that time in her life because it was not. I don't know if it was Alzheimer's, but but mm. it was something that was happening for her. But I, I think there was a, a beautiful reframe. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that she did find uh, a spiritual walk. She was very, um, she had a very strong belief later in her life. And, uh, you know, and she had long since, um, I think, the late 60s, uh, they, her and grandpa stopped drinking. Yeah. And, and so she she did find, which is quite amazing and beautiful to 
to to to see uh, her kind of have that walk and yes. and a very gentleness about her. So I, you know, I think she lived uh, that um, that calm place, and I see, and she lived. I think the forgiveness that I seen, even though I didn't hear it. No, but I think it's important that sometimes actions also speak so much louder than words, right? Yeah. If she's living at peace, and that's really yeah. what we can only hope for someone who's gone, no, no matter who they are, trauma mm -hmm. is a is a difficult uh, thing to get through. It, um, is. it is. You know, and so that makes it, that makes it um, more beautiful when we can reframe things in a way that takes that light, which is what you've done with your paintings. Talk to me a bit about the uh, the documentary, and I know mm -hmm. that we have a little bit touched on it through the, throughout the conversation, yeah. but but let's let's sort of break that open a little bit because I know I remember when it happened, you were like a super excited boy, and I am so glad that this has <laughs> happened for you. Uh, yeah. But let's talk about it. Like this is this was something that really well, you did not expect, you know, and boom. I think that work, and I don't think, I know the work that we've done uh, with Shaw and, and uh, community television and some of the other programs we were on, yeah. I, I just think that gave me um, another way of being creative. Yeah. And, and so uh, a friend of mine uh, who is uh, has Gamut Productions in Victoria, David uh, Meloshev, he uh, he sent me an email saying, "Hey, you should apply for this grant," and and it was a grant to produce a documentary. And ironically, it was called Game Changers. And I was wow. like, "No, I'm not <laughs> Talk a game about changer, the right, right? <laughs> I'm just an average guy." <laughs> but um, anyway, um, I got coaxed yeah. into putting a, a project forward, and we got it. And uh, so we developed a documentary, and it's the same title as the book, and it's called Truth, Art, and Reconciliation. And it's and it's um, a 37-minute documentary. It doesn't sound like it's very long, but... But I, you know what? I know what it takes to make a 37-minute uh, show, yeah. right? I know what it takes to do a 37-minute documentary yeah. with that kind of high-quality and high-caliber conversation. But you had actors and everything play you, right? Yeah, I I had two scenes, and that beach scene I talked about earlier. Um, yeah. I had um, a young uh, actor and model uh, Raymond who played me, uh, and 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 uh, nineteen seventy three and digging clams. So we were actually went to the beach and we filmed uh, clam digging day, and and we had this old kind of sepia tone look and looked like old eight millimeter kind of footage. Oh, I love it. And we did it twice. The one for my birthday, because that was a I got the set of paints for my thirteenth birthday that changed everything for me. Yeah. And in the and of course the clam digging winds of change uh, for me. And then in that, then there's I, I talk about uh, you know the paintings and stuff, and it it I, I feel very proud of it. At first I was like, golly, I'm just like I'm just like yakking here for thirty minutes, but you know we had other people um, involved in in the and the, like the sound and the settings and all those things are very beautiful uh, and I'm very proud of, of of what we put together and so uh, how, yeah, can so people, it, how can people see this the the uh, documentary is it available yet well, I know we were talking about it before but I wasn't sure if it was actually on well we're Denver. waiting to hear back we're going to premiere it at uh, Vancouver Island University where I had the art show Oh, wonderful. And then when we premiere it, then we're going to be able to do some things after with it. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. And um, it was another artistic way for me to connect. So yeah, so huge. Br bringing that part of it to being, you know, your the winds of change was a real family affair, uh, you know, when, when it was shown at VIU. Um, I, I mean, I loved, I was there uh, along with some of my friends and colleagues. And, you know, what, what was really inspirational for me about it was when you brought your children up on stage, your grandchildren, I should say. And, uh, and one of the muses for one of your most beautiful paintings in my eyes is that gorgeous granddaughter of yours. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that, that whole experience for her yeah. and for, and, and was that in the movie as well? 
Yeah, it is. It is in the movie. And and part of uh, my journey on this artwork piece was I just didn't want to create a bunch of heaviness. Yes, and, of course. And, yes. and, and I just thought I needed to have some kind of a flow. And, and one of the flows was, you know, I talked earlier about that um, ground zero painting that that was horrific for me. And I, I hid it away. I couldn't even look at it. It was very, very powerful. But the mm -hmm. counter to that was I, I painted my granddaughter, uh, Sophia. And and uh, it's funny, uh, 2005, I, I drew a picture called the kelp doll because we used to cut faces in bulb kelps. And mm -hmm. and and so I had this sitting there from, from since then, and I didn't find the right model. And all of a sudden, I looked at her and I went, oh, my gosh. That's her. <laughs> this is her. So I... I, I I took yes. some pictures of her. I did some studies, and and this was I think March or April 2020. And yeah. I had a friend of mine, uh, Linda, who made me the hat. Mm -hmm. And it's a cedar bark hat. Took three months to make, and um, and I put it on her, and I had I had a little white, white uh, goat wool vest, and and um, and I and and I was trying to get her to smile. And you know, kids sometimes when you say, "Can you smile?" And they give you that fake smile. Totally. Yeah, I, I know like, exactly that. Like, I have a few of those and I just couldn't, it was like <laughs> not right. Anyway, I got a fairly solid one and, but it was a really good picture of her. Yeah. And so I painted that and it, I was doing these paintings one a month, which was a lot. Incredible. And, and, and so I painted this one on, uh, we call it 300 uh, pound. It's a paperweight hot press and and uh, it was very, uh, I don't know, just, just to be able to paint her character and in watercolor portraits to get characters. It's pretty, pretty challenging. challenging. It's pretty yeah, challenging. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Uh, it's it's so a funny. medium that, it's a medium. I'm not much of a painter. Do not get me wrong. I dabble. I play. It is, you know, paint by numbers. I am not a painter. I am, you know, that's not what I do. But I do know one thing for sure is that the difference between acrylic paints and watercolors are so difficult yeah. for a watercolor to get a clear image and to get the texture just right without losing it in the blob for me it's yeah. the blob but for so you it's so so gorgeous yeah and and what i what i love about watercolors and i'll get back to the the portrait in a minute but watercolors um transparent watercolors is that it goes in and into the paper but the light hits through the through the paint and comes back, and it yeah, gives yeah. a trend. But oils and acrylic are, are are more opaque, and they they just bounce off the color. Yeah. But um, so this this piece, she she was dying. I kept my studio locked, dying to see it. <laughs> and uh, finally, one day, I opened up the door and I said, "Sophia, it's ready." And it's on the documentary. I we, yeah, we yeah, actually yeah. reenacted <laughs> that scene. It was cool. With Sophia. With yeah. Sophia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right he on. followed her with this crazy cool camera and um and she literally fell down like uh like Keanu Reeves in the Matrix, you know, where he slowly <laughs> bends over. So she's sliding in her slippery socks and she's just like, oh my gosh. But it's like <laughs> wow. it's like she's seen herself, but it was um it was more than that for her, and it was just yeah. almost like a ghost of from the past and herself and so it was a very surreal moment and uh mm -hmm. and anyway an absolutely moment. priceless painting as well for her I know yeah. that that's not a painting because I know you do sell some of your paintings but yeah. not many like mo for for these installations I well yeah these these to this, let them go I know I know uh but but that that one um painting though she um she was just so it was such a powerful moment to see her um with that you know with the the look that and i asked her about that i said you know i was trying to get you to smile honey but uh you know what were you thinking and she's like i was thinking about covid19 oh, and I thought, oh. <laughs> you know oh. and i thought i thought oh it's serious but you know and i thought you know what i bet you 150 years ago, children looking out over the, the these city, towns popping up and colonization and cities and brand new stuff. Absolutely. How do you how do you process that? That's yeah. the look she has in that painting, and it's uh, 
it's a very powerful and it gives people a breath you can breathe so part of part of what happened for me in the development of this art body of work is that instead of just looking at residential school and this and that and it's like a to b kind of linear yeah. thinking yeah and it allows people to kind of synthesize over space and you can absorb completely differently how how you see uh what has happened and how we can respond to that uh, vision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we when we think about the future of the winds of change and those beautiful paintings, what's your hope for them? I know your the the installation at VIU was what three weeks, I think you had it up there. Yeah. Um, are there, but, but these are, and I just want our audience to understand these paintings are not, you know, eight and a half by 11. These paintings are, mm four feet by six feet by some of them are even larger than that yeah. you know um and the, just the concept you know of painting these when they're this just the sheer size of them yeah. alone so so what is your hope for these paintings walking ahead well i i had a a vision to uh connect with the uh uh national truth reconciliation in in manitoba Mm -hmm. and Ottawa and also I have a connection and I haven't followed through with it yet just because I can't get the the body of work appraised yet of course. so I can't move it anywhere it's stacked up in crates in my studio yes. and it needs to be out there needs but, to um, be out there uh, one of the art professors at BAU she said this needs to be at the um uh, the Canadian uh, Canada House in London, England, because they have yes. a big gallery there. Yes, and I thought well, that would be interesting because that's kind of the uh, where some of uh, colonization and some of the things around residential school and laws came from. All that absolutely, it would, be, it would be powerful for them to to kind of see that in that way. So I, I I'm holding it, I'm keeping it together, and I had a lawyer beg, beg, beg me for a year and a bit to buy one. And I which one and the one that you mentioned with uh smoke of torment really because he was working with a client that was uh, uh in and around uh Cooper Island residential school and I thought okay uh so I talked to him and he and we agreed on a price and he said but it's too powerful for me to have in my home and I thought okay that's interesting <laughs> want to buy it and then you want to and then he said uh Let's uh, let's give it to Penelica tribe and have it go back home. Oh wow! So we are planning an event on Penelica, and I'm hoping it's in August when they do their big celebration. Yes. And we will do a formal presentation of uh, Smoke of Torment, and and it's it's both um, it'll it'll stir up a lot of feelings, but it's also very powerful in knowing that um, Indigenous people had maybe a secret connection to the crater during those times. Yes. And yes. and but it and then they get to see that yes, you know, that that was I knew that that the crater was there with us. And uh, so it's it'll be a powerful uh experience, I'm sure. No kidding. No yeah. kidding. I can't even imagine what it will be like for the the people to witness it and see it. Yeah. I know that the people that went to VIU over that period it there were times when i don't think that there was a dry eye right mm -hmm. so and it and it wasn't because these uh, uh, these paintings are depressing in fact they're anything but they're mm -hmm. beautiful uh depictions of survival and resiliency and mm -hmm. you know just everything that you would want when you're coming through something so powerful um what did you hope to achieve by doing these paintings beyond your own self-healing what did you hope for i wanted to create a language uh a visual language that yeah. um that that helps people understand where uh the written word uh falls short if i and there's some beautiful writers don't get me wrong of you course know, of course and 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 i just think that there's a language that um you know, we don't even need to um, worry about understanding. It's there for us to see, and then by seeing it, it it it'll it'll help change uh, 
one of uh, one of my friends, uh, sh she's a, a chiropractor, and her daughter. She brought her daughter, who was seven years old. And I was thinking, ooh, that's there's some yeah, there's that's some something powerful, powerful for a seven year old for sure. And, and she walked around with her mom, and she's a little bit of an artist, and uh, and, and so her mom said. What did you think of these? And she probably said one of the most profound, uh, you know, out of all the the statements that were written in the books. But what she said, "Mummy, I've never seen paintings that speak to me before." Mm. And I thought. So oh, your me. mission, your mission, and your goal was complete from the eyes of a seven year old <laughs> child. I mean, how how phenomenal is how that? How profound is yeah. that they speak to me, Mummy? I've never yeah. seen paintings that speak before like this. So, wow. so that was uh, that was a very um, incredible uh, kind of moment to 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 see that and to see her. So, uh, so when you go back to the IU for the showing of your wonderful documentary, I keep calling it a movie because I know you as well as I do. It's going to be more of a movie than a documentary, I'm sure, yeah. just because you're so fabulous. Um, oh, but I, I wonder when you take it up there to um, back to the VIU, will you be showcasing the paintings back there minus uh, minus the painting we've just spoken of, the, the Smoke of Torment? I yeah I I might I I just uh, I I was thinking about that that'll be a a bit of a go around but you know what I just think it would be important even if I had some of my really uh, key pieces yeah. um, up there and um, so I have one shores of indifference of all these amazing indigenous women that have risen out of um, yes in spite of 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 what's happening in Canada they still land on the shores of indifference uh, and. And it, and it it was just a way for me to honor the the teachers in my in my life uh, as becoming a healer twenty four years ago, and so but there's you know, some. It, yeah. it, it must be hard to choose, like when you think about the people that have yeah. inspired you and you know brought you through this life as it as it is now. Yeah. But if you could, um, you know, I know that there were a couple of people in your life that sort of really have stood out for you in the yeah. way of First Nations teachings. Uh, are they still with us? And and what were their what was their take on not only the I mean this this evolution of being yeah. okay? We've got the art installation. Now we have a documentary. Now we have a book. They're, I mean, they must be just gobsmacked in pride, right? Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, I do have to thank uh, my lovely wife, Bonnie. Of, of course. Uh, 40 years this November. Oh, my God. I mean, I know you guys have been married for a long, long time. And by the way, to our audience, Bonnie's the coolest chick ever. She just yeah. is. So, uh, she, you know, she's, been, you. Um, she's given me the space, um, yes. even though she's very uh, good at... Um, organizing situations in our lives yes, yes, um yes. i'll say it nicely yes um, yes but she as always allowed me uh the space to be creative and yeah. uh so i i really value that uh but you yeah. know what's interesting was though the the body of work was so emotionally difficult for me and yeah. and and i called upon my former professor of uh, uh counseling and we're still good friends. We're doing, we did a lot of work with Virginia Satir even after I was done my training. So we've maintained a lifelong friendship since 98. And yeah. she is in her early 80s and still a dynamite. But I called her up for some of the really difficult paintings and she helped me reground myself. Lovely. Every time. And uh, a couple of them, she would just like, oh, this is so <laughs> powerful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but, so I, I felt uh, very honored to uh, to have her and and my elder J C Lucas, uh, who, you know, uh, have some of these elders really support me and help me ground myself in in because uh, it's you know it's, it's not just about me as an artist but it's this whole thing was about my connecting wheel and my wheel of of uh, you know trust and support and so i do have a lot i have a lot of people to thank um for that for that journey that i was on 
Yeah, that you, you have really had some incredible people in your life and are still in your life now as we speak mm -hmm. that have really continued to support you. I know you're doing sweat lodges now uh, through the work that you're doing and a variety of other things within our community to help build people up through some of the more challenging experiences that they might have had, whether or not it has to do with residential school or not. Trauma comes from so many sources, oh, yeah. uh, you know, that we yes. we just really need to be aware of it. Um. I, I, I'm going to just take a very fast station identification. And that's only because I forgot to tell people to go get a piece of paper and a pen, because I know that they're going to want to reach out to you and find more information on seeing, you know, not only uh, when it does come up, they may want to be on your mailing list, or if you mm. have such a thing, do you have a website down by the way? I just, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I can't I'm, remember I'm, if you do I'm, or not. I am under construction right now. There you go. That's right. Uh, and and I have a brand new company with my friend, and it's called Raven Sky Productions. And we're just in the process of building it. But what I can do is you can reach out to me, and I'd be happy to put you on a mailing list. And it's uh, Raven. Well, wait, but wait for that because we got to tell people to get a piece of paper. So hold oh, on yeah, for yeah. a sec. So everybody, if you're listening right now, it's time to just grab your pen, pull over to the side of the road, grab whatever it is you need. Don't be writing and driving or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, and while you're busy doing that, I'll do just a quick station identification, let people know what's up. So uh, if you just tuned in, thanks for tuning in to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FM. I'm Kathy Holmes and delighted to be your host, not only on this show, but also on our sister show on Shaw Spotlight. So please, I hope you do tune into Shaw Cable 4. Dan's actually part of that show as well. So do make yeah. sure you watch us whenever you can. We're, uh, I think, four times a day Vancouver Island wide. So we're super happy to uh, have our newest episode coming out early next week. Uh, actually, early this week, by the time you see, that, see this, because this is a pre-recording. So my apologies for that, but we should put that out there. While we're in the middle of writing things down, another thing you'll want to write uh, down is about the Red Heart Breakfast. And that is going to be something really quite really quite wonderful the team from together we shine our uh, shine 2023 which is also coming up soon uh has has uh, instrument has instrumented a wonderful opportunity to help uh, at-risk women within our community. And so the Red Heart Breakfast is going to be on May 10th at the Vancouver Island Convention Center. Uh, it's going to go from 9 till 10.30. Breakfast doesn't cost a doggone thing. We will ask you for a donation while we're there. I would love to see you there. So please make sure if you can show up and show your support for this amazing fundraiser to help at-risk youth and women in our community. All those dollars are going to go to AVI, who has been on the ground uh, during the last few years in support, uh, and we need more programs for them. So we do appreciate that. Um, or you can also watch us on YouTube. Don't forget to watch us on YouTube, by the way. Like and subscribe. Share, share, share. Uh, we want to get the word out of all the great things that are being done right here in our beautiful community. Not only that, you can also listen to us on iTunes heart radio and spotify so there's lots of platforms for you to pay attention to act three and i hope that you will continue to support us in community as we share what i feel are the beautiful little nuggets of great things that we're doing right here to support everyone that we are are working alongside and right now i hope you've got your pen and paper handy because dan elliott uh raven tales from mac3 but daniel elliott on his own fabulous accord uh truth art and reconciliation and the winds of change how do people find you my friend well i know uh i'm gonna have to steer them to my uh, personal email and I will uh, connect them to uh, a page that when I get uh, set up. So that is at uh, ravendaniel60 at gmail.com. So uh, raven as in the bird, R-A-B-E-N and D-A-N-I-E-L 60 at gmail.com. And I will connect you uh, when I get all my um, brand new uh, Raven Sky Productions and my art page up. So fantastic. Well, that's yeah, so exciting. So. I'm 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 really delighted. I'm delighted to see this whole body of work move forward. I think that it's it will become 
uh, I think the most pinnacle work that's been done, period, as it relates to First Nation communities, not only through truth and reconciliation, but also through the just the overall cultural aspect uh, that that we we really want to share with all of Canada, not just with Vancouver Island. Right. Dan, um, you know, we're at the, almost at the end of the program. I know it goes very, very quickly. I could talk to you for hours so <laughs> easily, so easily. But what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is share some of the wisdom, if you don't mind. Like if you were, if you could take away some of the tidbits that you've learned through this process, what might that look like for you? Well, for me, you know, until we have a really clear understanding, um, because if we can't identify it, whether we're Canadians or not, if you can't identify something, you can't change it. Yeah. So, so I a big part of it is, and I think reconciliation and the whole concept around what's happening around that, it's not yeah. going to be a finite bit of time. It's its going to be a part of our history, or, yeah. you know, whether we like it or not. So, and then, uh, you know, I have so many wonderful friends like yourself who are champions to what's right and what needs to happen. And, you know, so many people, uh, you know, be open to uh, knowing that you may have a wrong opinion and yeah. that's okay you know because well, we we weren't learned we weren't taught in schools totally and that's what I was just going to say when I was growing up I had my my friend Patsy Gerard I've talked about this young lady many times in life uh Patsy was part of the 60s scoop one minute she was there the next minute she was gone I was six years old maybe five six years old I didn't even know what happened to her. She was the only First Nations person in my school. And when I was growing up, I was taught that First Nations people, you know, were separate. They were not part of our community. They were not part of us. Yeah. And so I, I had very wrong assumptions. Uh, and about 10 years ago, I was introduced to what really happened. And then everything changed. Everything yeah. changed, right? It's true. It's absolutely true. I uh, am part of a group called uh, Culturally Committed. Yes. Very powerful and incredibly powerful. I'm I'm uh, feel very honored to be a part of the mentors on that. And people will ask questions as professionals about supporting and working with First Nations because they just don't know and they don't they don't want to be offensive. So we have once a month call-ins and stuff. So there's so, there are some huge movements. I got to know some fantastic doctors yeah. uh, and health professionals that are just really wanting to do what's right. And when when that comes out in in somebody's intention, then it's it's easy to do the right thing. You I know? couldn't agree with you more. And it yeah. may and the the foundation of the easy thing becomes yeah. settled in our spirit, and then we're part of the solution as opposed yeah. to being part of the problem. Dan Elliott, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on CHLY today. Thank you so much for being here, my friend. We say ASIM, which is oh honored one. Hi Sepkasiem. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Kathy, for being my friend and having me here today. Well, you know what? I love you more than life itself. I am so grateful for our friendship. You know, folks, today, I hope that you learned a little something, something from uh, my friend, Dan. Uh, I know that if you get an opportunity to see the winds of change and that installation, you will be gobsmacked and moved beyond words on so many levels. So if you get the inf information to Dan at uh, Raven, say that again for me, Dan. Real Raven quick. Daniel 60 at Gmail. Raven and I will contact Dan you. I will, and I'll, I'll connect you up. He'll connect you up. I promise he will. You have been listening to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FN. I'm Kathy Holmes. Oh, by the way, one more thing. If you should happen to have an extra, you know, couple bucks that's running around your pocket right about now, may I invite you to consider offering it up to CHLY 101.7 FM? I have to tell you, the reason that this show stays on the air is because of donors just like you. It doesn't take a lot, but we're in the middle of our fund drive. And in order to keep shows not only like this one, but many of the incredible programs that we do have on CHLY, we could use a couple bucks to do so. So if you don't mind, think of us when you're thinking about your charity charitable donations in 2023. Thanks again for tuning in to Act 3 on CHLY. We'll see you next time and have a great day. Bye for now.